Well, good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. Do you realize that you have an amazing pastor? Um, let me tell you something about her that you don't know. Uh, she and her family recently had to interrupt their vacation to go to a dentist. And Marion informed the dentist, I want a tooth pulled. I don't want Novocaine because we're in a big hurry. <laughs> Just extract the tooth as quickly as you can and we'll be on our way. Well, the dentist was quite impressed. He says, well, you're certainly a courageous woman. Which tooth is it? And she turned to her husband and said, show him your tooth, dear. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, that didn't really happen. <laughs> but, but the point of the little story is, volunteering is a lot easier when we get to volunteer someone else, right? <laughs> and today we're going we're gonna to examine a different aspect of volunteering. Uh, we're going to focus on the difference between volunteers and servants. And today's scripture lesson is just, I find it fascinating. It's not a parable, but it's a, it's a lot like a parable. It's a story that took place, but it just packs quite a punch. It's, I just have to confess to you, it's a story that makes me uncomfortable. Listen to this. From Mark chapter beginning, but 10, beginning with verse 35, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What's your request, he asked. They replied, well, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right, the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we're able. Then Jesus told them, huh, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering but I have no right to say who sits on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. Well, when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people and officials, and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many." Does this passage bother you? Frankly, it, it bothers me. Not because I don't believe it. I, I believe it, but because I've not always lived this. Let's be honest. Who wants to be told that your goal in the kingdom of God is to be a servant? It recently dawned on me that in my 40 years as a pastor, I attended many, many leadership conferences, all kinds of seminars, all kinds of uh, workshops. In fact, I can't even tell you how many I attended. But it dawned on me. In all of those 40 years as a pastor, I never once attended a seminar or any kind of conference that was primarily focused on being a servant. And yet when I listen to Jesus, he says, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. What does that mean? I mean, what does it mean to be a servant? I mean, what's it like to have a name tag, and on the name tag it simply says, servant? When I read this story about Jesus sitting on his throne next to his heavenly father, I don't know about you, but I like to imagine myself as a guest in that big throne, throne room of the God's kingdom, you know, and frankly, it never enters my mind that I would like to be one of the servants who works from sun up to sun down to make sure the room is ready and the food is prepared and floors have been swept and mopped and the dinnerware is spotless and all the details are covered. I mean, you know, unlike James and John, I don't have to sit next to Jesus, but I sure would like a seat somewhere in the room. And I'd like for someone to bring my food to me when it's time for dinner to be served. And that's what, I, that's what I meant when I said, when I finished reading the scripture, it bothers me. Hear it again. Among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of God, or Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, when we become followers of Christ, he actually does give us this name tag that says servant. And our mission now is not to find out how we can make things better for us, but how can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I make life better for you? And I want us to fin spend just a few moments um, reflecting on what this means. Let's, let's, let's dig into this a little bit. The first thing I, I, I understand is something is not really attractive, and that is that much of what a servant does goes unnoticed. I mean, that really blesses you, doesn't it? When guests arrive, the servants usually disappear, unless, of course, they have a task of doing something specific for the guest. And all this hard work that they've done to get this thing ready, nobody seems to think much about that. More than ever, I'm convinced that when we all get to heaven and our Lord begins to reveal to us the unseen and the unappreciated acts of servants given by his children, we're going to be astonished. I think we're just going to be blown away with what he has taken notice of that we didn't notice. And those acts of service that we did, that we didn't think anybody paid any attention, and yet he did. Never allow the enemy of your soul to convince you that God will not honor your works of service done in his name. And the second thing that I, I think about when I, when I look at this is that we serve people, but we work for Jesus. That's important to understand. If you forget this truth, you'll soon be both frustrated and defeated. Our master is not those people we serve. We serve them, and we hope they are pleased, but ultimately our goal is to please our master, Jesus. We don't get our fulfillment from what others think about us, but rather from what our master thinks about us. The moment we lose sight of that, we become slaves to the opinions of others. And that's a terrible, destructive slavery. On the other hand, when we begin to see our service to others as actually a form of worship to our Lord, even the smallest and the seemingly insignificant acts of service become gifts of worship to our Lord. 
And knowing that we have pleased him does wonders for our fulfillment and our inner security. The third thing is that our model is none other than Jesus himself. He says, uh, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, when I get discouraged and I just feel, you know, unappreciated, all I have to do is look at Jesus. I mean, he came to this world that he created and he owns and he humbled himself and he served us even when we didn't appreciate it. And he's our model. He graciously took on that name tag, servant. And he waited on the guest. And then he gave them this ultimate gift of servitude, his life to rescue them. Do you understand that when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, that he was urging Jesus to sit at the table and be served rather than do the serving. In other words, he was offering Jesus the opportunity to be in control and to do things his way. And he offers us the same temptation. You see, Jesus had every right to be the master, but he chose to be the servant because the guest desperately needed his salvation, his, re his redemption. So we're constantly offered these other alternatives, and Satan will package these uh, temptations in, in very religious, spiritual garb. They look attractive. They sound practical. But for the true disciple, Jesus and Jesus alone is our model. The fourth thing, Jesus is calling us to far more than just works of service. Did you know that the greatest enemy of being a servant of Jesus is not outright rebellion, but substituting good works and good service for submission to Jesus? You see, doing good work can actually be appealing. In fact, we love to call attention to our good works, don't we? We like to do that and have people applaud us for that. But service done in the name of Jesus doesn't call attention to us. It calls attention to Him. We're thrilled when He is honored. We're delighted when He's given the credit. And we are delighted to be a part of His mission. And we are especially excited and thrilled when someone responds in obedience and becomes his follower. You see, it's about him. It's not about us. So, how do we know if we are a servant? Are you ready for this? Someone put it like this. You know you are a servant. When you don't get upset when someone treats you as a servant. Oh, I hate that definition. <laughs> because sometimes I get upset. The fifth thing is that Jesus is calling us to give up our rights, our self-rule, and become his servants. Let's put it another way. We are to quit being volunteers and become servants. You understand how radical that is? That's not an easy thing to do. Volunteers decide what they'll volunteer for. How long are they going to serve? And the condition under which they will serve. In other words, volunteers are in charge. I like being in charge, don't you? Servants, on the other hand, are under the authority of the master. Servants don't set their own agendas. 
Servants don't decide who they will serve and when they will serve. The master decides those things. I think the greatest temptation that we have is to read this passage and simply say, well, I need to be a better servant. I need to go out and do more acts of kindness. I need to be a better person. Do you understand that if that is the extent of our response, Satan will be delighted. He frankly isn't overly concerned if you just try to be better. So what's the real message here this morning? Jesus is calling us to give up our right to be in charge and truly become his servants. We are to die to self-rule and become submissive servants to him. I mean, that's far different than agreeing to be a better person. He's calling us to become his, his property, his possession, his servants. And that's why he calls us to repentance. Repentance is acknowledging, I've not been living that way, and I need to start living that way. I've been in charge, but I want you to be in charge. That's what repentance is. So it's, it's a radical decision to change our whole direction and the trajectory of our whole life. The other day, I, I read about a sixth grade teacher who was grading an exam paper that she had given to the kids, and it was in history class. And one of the boys was writing about Benjamin Franklin. And he said, quote, Franklin died in 1790 and is still dead. You see, our problem is that we may have died to self-rule at one time, but we're not still dead. Somehow we keep being resurrected to this self-centeredness, right? So here's the big question of the day. Whose servant are you? Are you a servant to the opinion of others? Are you living under the illusion that you're no one's servant? Are you trying to live that impossible illusion of being a part-time servant of Jesus and a part-time servant of your own agenda? I think this is really tough for us Americans. We've grown up being taught that we have our rights. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I deeply cherish the freedoms that we have in this country. But it's easy to start thinking of our rights in a way that are diametrically opposed to our Lord's call to be servants. He calls us to bring our rights to him and to lay them at his feet and become his servants. I end with this. Today, you will leave this place with an invitation to serve in the master's universe. And this universe is filled with guests who have very little respect for servants. In many situations, you will not even be on their radar. But the master has called you and me to join him in serving those that he has invited to his table to taste the salvation of his kingdom. Serve them well. Serve them in the name of Jesus. Serve them with joy because you work for the master who redeemed you and made you whole. May I pray with you? Father, it's, uh, it's tough to admit sometimes that we have insisted on being in control. Forgive us. And right now, in this context, we say to you, take control. We submit to you. 
we want to be your followers. And yes, we want to be your servants. Father, we have to admit that we're comfortable talking about servanthood. We just aren't real comfortable being servants. And we struggle when our service is not noticed or appreciated. And we get upset when no one says thank you or appreciates our labor. But remind us this morning that we don't work for others. We work for you. May we look for your smile of approval. May we tune our ears to hear your words of affirmation. And may our everyday works of service become acts of grateful worship offered up to you. We ask this in the name of the one who became a servant to us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.